Hi class, welcome to your next screencast. This one's going to be on ions versus isotopes. First thing I want to do is go over atoms and the fact that they are neutral. So if we look at the atomic number, you should remember that's number of protons in an atom, but the number of protons always have to equal the number of electrons because atoms are neutral with no charge, so negatives and positives have to cancel out. So you could also tell that what the number of electrons is by looking at the atomic number of an atom. Then we have the atomic mass, which is the number of protons in an atom, plus the number of neutrons in an atom. They will always add up together, and they are found in the nucleus. They actually form the nucleus. The electrons are the negatively charged ones that are found in the shells, or the cloud, or the orbits around the nucleus of an atom. So if I was looking at an atom like potassium and I asked you, okay, how many protons are in potassium? You would have to look at the atomic number and tell me 19. You should automatically know that the number of electrons should be the same since they are neutral. Positives and negatives have to cancel out. The neutrons is one that you have to do a little math. You have to take the atomic mass and subtract it, subtract the atomic number from it, or the number of protons. So 39 minus 19, which will give you 20 neutrons. Again, the protons and the neutrons equal the mass. Looking at elements, so when you have a bunch of the same atoms, it really forms an element because there's more than one atom. So a pure substance is made of only one type of atom. And I talked about beryllium in the first screencast and how if I had this chunk of beryllium, it would exhibit all these properties. And then if I cut it in half and had half of it, it would still exhibit all these properties. And if I took just a little chunk of it, it would exhibit all these properties. And if I finally just took one itsy bitsy atom of it, one, one atom of beryllium, it would exhibit all these properties. But if you go below an atom and you look at the subatomic particles, it can't exhibit the same properties as beryllium. And so that's where you actually differ between atoms and elements and subatomic particles. They have to exhibit the same properties. And that goes for sulfur or gold or any of the 100, over 100 elements on the periodic table. All right. Quick recap as well, protons, neutrons, and electrons. Protons are positive, neutrons are neutral, electrons have a negative charge. The protons and the neutrons are the only two that have a significant mass, and those um, that's what makes up the nucleus, and when you have the nucleus, that's where the mass of the atom is. So that's where we get our mass number, those two put together. The number of um, protons can never change because it defines an element. So if I look at boron, Boron has an atomic number 5, which means it has 5 protons. But if I give it another proton, it's not boron anymore, it's now carbon, and vice versa with anything. If you go down one, it's not boron anymore, it's beryllium. The number of neutrons can change, and so we're going to talk about something called isotopes today, and that's going to affect how much they weigh, which is their mass number. And you can, you can definitely change the amount of electrons in an atom, and when you do that, it's called an ion, and ions determine the electrons gaining or losing determines how that atom is going to react with other atoms and form chemical reactions in other substances. And that's what we're going to get to mainly with bonding in the next screencast. Okay, let's look at ions. Ions is when an atom gains or loses an electron. And so if we look at sodium right here, sodium normally has 11 protons and 11, 11 protons and 11 electrons. And when you put them around the shell, if you remember, we have two that fit in the first shell, max. And then, for our purposes in biology, eight in every shell after that. And so, you keep on adding shells on until you run out of your electrons. And in this case, you have to make a third shell to put this lonely little electron. And atoms like to become, atoms like to be stable. And to be stable, an atom has to have a full valence shell of electrons. And so remember that the outside shell is called a valence shell. And in this case, it could hold eight, but there's only one. So there's seven more places that electrons can go. This makes an atom unstable. Whether there's one or whether there's seven, as long as there's not eight in these shells, it's not stable. That means that the atom is going to try to become stable by gaining or losing electrons. And in this case, it's easier to get rid of one electron than it is to find seven more to fill its shell. And so that's exactly what it do, does. Sodium will kick out its last electron and lose it and give it up. That will make it drop down one shell to two shells, and now it has eight electrons in its valence shell, and it's stable, and it's good. But in the process, 
it went from 11 protons and 11 electrons being neutral, sodium is neutral, to having 11 protons and 10 electrons instead. And when you do that, you have one more positive than negative, so it gives it a positive one charge. And so we write it as sodium plus one, or just sodium and A plus. Over here, we have the same issue. This is lithium. Lithium has a valence shell that only has one electron when there could be seven more in there. It is easier to give up one than to find seven more electrons. So it will kick out and give up this electron and drop down a shell to be stable. Remember, the first shell is stable at two. Everything else has to be eight. So two would be stable and it would be happy. Um, but it's not, so it kicks it out and now it will have not um, three electrons and three protons. That's making that's what it was. It will now have three protons and two electrons, which gives it a neg a positive one charge. In this case of fluorine, fluorine usually has nine protons and nine electrons, but in this case it has seven valence electrons. That means it can gain one more to become stable, and so that's exactly what it does right here. It will gain an electron. In this case lithium's electron. And when it does that, it has a full valence shell, but it also has one more electron. So it has nine protons and ten electrons now, total. And that gives it a negative one charge, so we write it as fluorine negative instead. Over here, it's the same thing. Sodium once more, it will give up an electron and drop down to become stable. And in this case, the seven electrons, it's easier to find one more right here to become stable, and it will actually gain an electron. So, if you gain an electron, you become negative, and if you lose an electron, you become positive, which is the hard thing to keep straight. Just remember, when you're hanging around with negative people and they finally go away from you, it's a more positive place, and vice versa. So, the process of gaining or losing electrons is called ionization, and in the next screencast, we're going to talk about ionic bonds, and this is going to be a big deal, because that's how they form. Um, when it's positive... So sodium lost its electron, which made it have more protons. It's called a cation. So when it's positively charged ion, it's called a cation. When it gains in those, elect those negative electrons, it becomes more negative, and so it gives a negative charge. We call those anions. So let's look at the difference between them. Cation versus anion. Cation has a positive charge, which means that the atom has, if it's positive charge, it has more protons, so that means the atom lost electrons, which means they don't add up anymore. There's more positive protons. So lithium, it's going to lose one. It's easier to lose one than to gain seven. So we write it as lithium plus one. It used to have three protons, but now it only has two electrons. So that's why it's a positive one charge. Over here, we had 12 protons, and we used to have 12 electrons, but we have two valence electrons in magnesium. It is easier to get rid of two electrons than it is to find six. So it will kick out these two valence electrons, making it have 10 electrons, which gives it a positive two charge. So we write it as magnesium plus two. Aluminum. Aluminum had... 13 protons and 13 electrons. But we have one, two, three valence electrons in aluminum. It's easier to get rid of three than it is to find five to be stable. So it will kick out these three and become 10 electrons, which gives it a positive three charge. So we write aluminum plus three. The opposite is an anion. It has a negative charge. So that means that the atom has gained one or more electrons. Chlorine. Chlorine usually has 17 protons and 17 electrons. In its valence shell, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, it's looking for one more to fill its valence shell, and it will gain one right there. And when it does, it will have 18 electrons and 17 protons, which gives it a negative 1 charge, so we write it as chlorine negative 1. Sulfur. It has 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, six electrons in its valence shell, so it normally has 16 protons, but 
in this case, we have to find one, two more. When we gain two more, we'll have 18. And that will give it a negative two charge. And so we write it as sulfur negative two. Over here, phosphorus normally has the same amount of protons and electrons, which is 15. But in this case, we have one, two, three, four, five valence electrons. It's looking to gain one, two, three. It's easier to gain three than it is to kick out five. So it will find three more and get 18 electrons instead of 15, which gives it a negative three charge instead. So we write phosphorus negative three. So that's the difference between a cation and an anion. The periodic table set up pretty easy so you could figure this out. And one thing that we're going to look at is the valence, um, the dot structures that we looked at last screencast. So everything in column one has one valence electron. Everything in column two has two. Three valence, four valence, five, six, seven, eight. The most that we could have in our shells is eight. So it makes sense that it should go one to eight. Now, one fun thing is that the columns don't only tell you the valence electrons, but it will tell you what ion they become and what charge they get. So in this case, column one, it's easier to lose one electron over here than it is to gain one. And so these guys will all kick out and lose one electron. And when you lose one electron, you have one more positive proton, so you get a plus one charge. In column two, beryllium, magnesium, calcium, etc., it's easier to lose two electrons than it is to find more six more. So these will lose two electrons. And when you lose two electrons, that means you have two more positives than negatives. So you have a plus two charge. In this case, three electrons will be lost. So this will have a plus three charge. This can be a plus or minus charge. These typically don't ionize very well. They form um, molecules instead with covalent bonds, but I guess it, I suppose they could. Column five. Um, there's five valence electrons, so they're looking for one, two, three more to become stable. It's easier to find three than it is to kick out five, so they will actually gain three electrons. And when you gain more negativity, you become negative, so they will have a negative three charge. In this column, negative two charge. They will find two more electrons. They will find one more electron in column seven. And in this column, they will not gain or lose any. This is a column that we call the noble gases. The noble gases are stable. They have a full valence shell. Remember that helium is still full because the first shell could only hold two, and that's how many it's holding, so that makes it stable. They are inert, meaning that they do not react because they are stable. They don't get together with other elements to com combine compounds and molecules and bigger things. They, they stay, they're kind of stuck up and stay, they stay by themselves. That's, they think they're noble and they're great. So um, that's what we call inert. These guys don't react with anything. And those are ions. Okay. Last one is isotopes. Isotopes is when we're dealing with neutrons. And anytime you're dealing with neutrons, you are going to change the mass. So you're going to change the mass of the atom. Remember last screencast, I talked about isotopic symbols. An isotopic symbol is when you write the mass as a superscript in front of the symbol to designate what mass it is. And it's so we could tell the difference between the isotopes of the different atoms. When an atom gains or loses a, a neutron, it could get heavier or lighter. And that's how we designate it. So lithium, this is a normal lithium on the periodic table. It has a mass of seven, which means it has four neutrons and three protons. When you add up the nucleus, it should add up to seven, and it does. Um, but lithium can form two different isotopes. It could lose a neutron, and when it does, it has three protons, three neutrons, which gives it a mass of six. So we call it lithium six. This is lithium seven. And this one's lithium eight, where it actually gains another neutron. Over here, we have helium. Helium is actually normally has a mass of four. 
It's number two on the periodic table, two protons. So you can see the red two protons don't change. The two electrons don't change. The only thing that's changing in these isotopes are the number of neutrons. This is helium-5. We would write it as He5. This is helium-6. There's two extra neutrons here. There are three extra neutrons in helium-7, and there are actually four extra neutrons in helium-8. Sometimes you could drop, you don't have to write the two here all the time, but you can. It should be understood that helium always has two, so a lot of times they drop the subscript of the atomic number. This is hydrogen. So this is normal hydrogen. Hydrogen is the only atom that does not have a neutron, so it's really one proton. So it's hydrogen one. Sometimes it could gain neutrons, and the mass goes up to two, called tritium, or deuterium. Tritium is when it gains two neutrons and its mass goes up to three. So these are called isotopes. Radioactive isotopes is just when an isotope has a very unstable nucleus. Sometimes when you add too many neutrons or you take away too many neutrons, it causes instability in the center because all the positive protons are pushing against each other. Remember that opposites attract and like repels. It's like two magnets. Um, if you turn the right ends together, they attach because opposites attract the negative and positive ends at, attach to each other but if you turn it around the magnets won't stick because the two positive ends are pushing away from each other when you have a bunch of positive protons and the neutrons aren't um, interspersed evenly between them the protons will push on each other and cause the nucleus to want to break apart to become stable and so um, it causes that instability and them pushing on each other trying to become stable releases energy and certain particles and we call that radiation. The particles, um, you may have heard alpha particles, beta particles, gamma, gamma rays, things like those. Some You'll probably learn those in chemistry next year. It's not important for us in biology right now. But that's what radiation really is. It's when you get an isotope that has an unstable nucleus and they release this large amount of energy that kind of messes up the atom and it's trying to become stable. And so here's carbon-12. This is not oh, but just about 99% of all the carbon on Earth is carbon-12. Carbon-13 is right around 1% of all the carbon on Earth. And less than a, just a fraction of a percent is actually carbon-14, which is radioactive because there's too many neutrons and it's causing the nucleus to become unstable. They could actually measure the amounts and quantities of these in the atmosphere and in all things particularly living things, and they know the certain ratio that there should be. So when something dies or they find something and they dig up fossils and they want to know, hey, how old is this fossil? They could actually measure the quantity of carbon in carbon-14 versus carbon-13 versus carbon-12 in a sample of an organism, and they could tell how old it was by the ratios. Um, the ratio won't add up anymore based on the age. The ratio gets less and less and less the older it gets. And so um, that's really what radioactive carbon-14 dating is all about. It's a little bit more detailed and complex than that, but for now that should be good. So atoms are neutral, ions are positive or negatively charged because they gained or lost electrons, and isotopes is a different number of neutrons which causes the mass to be greater or less. Hopefully that was helpful and you understand the difference between the three. All right, see ya. Bye.